Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, Queen Mary University of London Blizzard Institute webinar for um, uh, the Emergency Medicine Resuscitation Masters Programme, Pediatric Emergency Medicine Programme, various other programmes. My name is Ben Bloom. I'm one of the core faculty and I run one of the modules in one of our masters. Um, it's only one minute past six. So I'm going to give it another couple of minutes uh, to allow people to join because uh, several, many, many people have registered to, to uh, join this webinar. Um, so we'll give it another couple of minutes. And ladies and gentlemen, just while we are waiting for people to join in, I'm going to briefly introduce myself. My name's Tim Harris. Um, I have the honour of working with Ben and indeed Seg, who we will introduce shortly, and Chris, who you can see top right of the screen. Once um, we've, we've heard Seg's, we're going to take some questions and then I'm going to talk briefly uh, about a master's programme that we run, um, which I hope appeal to many of you. I'm going to mute myself and hand back to Ben. Right, well, I think we'll we'll get cracking. So um, welcome, everybody. This is a really phenomenal response, and I'm absolutely delighted to uh, to be here. Um, and honoured to uh, introduce a colleague from St. Bartholomew's Hospital, um, which is uh, uh, the oldest hospital in the UK, about to celebrate its 900th um, anniversary or birthday, if you like. Woo woo! Um, and is one of five major acute hospitals in Bart's Health NHS Trust, which is a, a really big NHS secondary care, tertiary care provider in North East London. Um, and in Bart's Hospital, um, there is uh, there are specialties in cardiac, so it's the largest cardiac centre in Europe. Uh, oncology, uh, respiratory, and the intensive care that is required to support all the patients in those three core specialties. So Shagun Olasanya is a colleague over at Bart's Hospital. He's a consultant. In other countries, they call that an um, attending in intensive care medicine. Um, he has a specialist interest in ultrasound, to be delighted to hear, as well as ECMO and ECPR. And he's going to talk to us today about point of care ultrasound in the pre-hospital setting. Fire away. Thank you very much. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I am just going to share my screen and bring up my presentation, which hopefully you can all see. Brilliant. Um, again, thank you very much for a wonderful intro. And I'm here to talk to you about point of care ultrasound in the pre-hospital setting. Um, I feel a little bit like a fraud doing this because I don't actually do pre-hospital medicine at the moment, but I will be doing transfer medicine as part of the new pan-London critical care transfer service known as ACCESS. Um, nonetheless, the same principles kind of apply because it's all about doing ultrasound at the point of care. Um, here are my declarations of interest. Um, I have a number of declarations of interest, particularly related to ultrasound. Um, I'm a member of the Focus Ultrasound and Intensive Care or FUSIC committee, which governs ultrasound training and um, accreditation for intensive care in the UK. Um, I've also been paid by a number of people, so Sonosite and GE, to teach ultrasound in the past and Econus as well. So these are the aims and objectives for so over the next 45 minutes, over the next 45 minutes or so, I want to talk to you about and give you an overview of point of care ultrasound um, to describe, use some cases to describe how point of care ultrasound can be used in the pre-hospital environment. And also at the end, talk about some of the exciting developments and maybe give you some idea of where this is all going to be going. So. This is a pretty recognizable picture, isn't it? This is the pre-hospital environment. Um, I believe that's actually Scott Greer, um, uh, one of the pre-hospital doctors that I know. Um, and it's a pretty, you guys know this quite well, but it's quite a complicated, dangerous environment. You get quite sick people, you're know, often in the middle of nowhere and may not have that much support. And you're delivering amazing complex interventions and saving lives um, under, the, under these circumstances. And all of you guys are either training in it or doing in it or doing it. You've been doing this for a long time and you've been managing to do this with your five senses and with this device from the 1800s developed by Lenec known as the stethoscope. And that's pretty amazing. And you think to yourself, you diagnose all of these things, you diagnose heart failure, bleeding, tension pneumothoraces and all of these things. 
And so you can argue to yourself, I'm pretty good. I don't need to do anything more. Why should I bother learning point of care ultrasound? What can it really deliver? Well, imagine going beyond this to what you can actually really see inside the person. And that's what point of care ultrasound is. There are lots of different definitions. You can read of it in the literature, but I say just stick to the basics. It's point of care ultrasound. It is basically ultrasound at the point of care. And traditionally, the way people think about it is we used to think about ultrasound as somebody sitting like this. So this is me scanning somebody with a big machine that you kind of have to wheel around. It's big and bulky. And so therefore, can it really be applied to the hospital setting? Well, that's all changed because now the machines look like this and they're quite small. They fit in your pocket and they attach to your phone. And these are these are revolutionized the ability. This is revolutionized the ability for us to deliver ultrasound truly at the point of care, because now you have a machine that doesn't take up any space at all and basically is about the same as carrying your stethoscope and you can take it to the patient and you can scan at the bedside. So fair enough, you've got the technology in your hands. What can you do with it? The answer is quite a lot. You can actually scan the whole patient from head to toe with ultrasound and gain information about a whole bunch of information from airway to breathing to circulation to disability and exposure, which is what you're doing when you're managing the acute critically unwell patient in the pre-hospital environment. And sometimes when they're not so unwell in the critically unwell environment. How do we do this? Well, I'm gonna go through a series of cases. So this is us, our, our team, and we're gonna now start going through some classical cases that we've probably seen, in the, that you may have seen in the pre-hospital environment, and I've certainly encountered sometimes as the receiving doctor in the hospital and intensive care. So this is a fairly use, usual one. We've got a trauma alert. Um, an 18 year old has been hit. Um, he was a moped rider, he's been hit by a car, and he's got what looks to be, has been described um, on the initial dispatch as chest and abdominal injuries, and he's got a low conscious level. So you arrive, you place him in a collar, and he looks a bit like this. And this is all stuff that's very familiar to us. And normally we'd, you know, we'd, again, as mentioned, we'd use our five senses and our stethoscope to try and work out exactly what was going on with this patient. And we would be using the classical approach of CABC, so catastrophic hemorrhage, airway breathing circulation, or March, if you're a fan of the ATAC, of, of the ATAC course, which is pretty much the same thing, and trying to assess the patient. But what can the ultrasound do here? Or well, ultrasound can do everything that you would do with your hands and with your eyes and ears and your stethoscope and go through your CABC, your vascular access and hemorrhage control, airway breathing, circulation and disability. So how do you start? Well, you can start by assessing the patient. So you might want to assess the patient and feel his hands and see whether he's cool and clammy and look for any signs that he's got bleeding. But you can put a probe on and have a quick look at his heart. And here is an echo of a heart that has actually hyperdynamic function. So this is the left ventricle here. This is the left atrium. This is the aortic root. And this is not a normal heart. This heart's actually going like the clappers. It's going really, really fast. It's beating like this. And you can see here, this is a short axis view, which looks at the short axis of the left ventricle. The left ventr ventricular cavity is actually being completely squeezed and obliterated. We call this the kissing ventricle sign. And this is a sign of a patient that's got very, very low preload. And in the case of somebody who's been hit by a car, the most likely thing is that they're bleeding somewhere. So instantly you can work out that the reason why it's got a low conscious level might be because of blood loss. And so your first step is then going to be to try and restore the volume. So you might think to yourself, I need to get some access into this gentleman. So you might want to go straight for an IO because you might not be very, very sure. You might not be sure of being able to get access. But what happens if the patient looks like this and you can't feel any landmarks? What are you going to do about your IO then? Yes, you can do ultrasound guided intraosseous access because your ultrasound probe allows you to actually see where the tibial cortex or the humeral cortex actually is. You can actually use color. You can use color Doppler to identify if there are any overlying blood vessels, and you can therefore direct your intraosseous needle directly into the cortex and ensure that you're actually in the cortex. You can then also use Doppler to flush your intraosseous, your intraosseous cannula and establish whether you're actually truly intraosseous with the proper color Doppler signal or whether you're actually just extravasating it in the skin. So you can accurately place an intraosseous needle with ultrasound in people who you might find it difficult. 
You may not need to do that. You may also you may want to go straight for a trauma line, in which case you can access the subclavian vessels, which you know, as we know, in a trauma, you want to go for a nice vessel that's above the clavicle in case there's um pelvic in case of pelvic bleeding. This is normally done um using landmark technique, but with ultrasound, as you can see here on the left, you can actually see the clavicle here, and you can actually see the subclavian vein, and there's a needle going directly towards the subclavian vein. So you can do your trauma, you can do your trauma line with real-time ultrasound guidance. One of the other things that ultrasound can be very useful for, classically, we can do, you do the trauma line um, and you perform bilateral thoracostomies because you're worried about, um, you're worried about intrathoracic bleeding and you're worried about bilateral pneumothoraces. But now you can actually scan the lungs and look to see whether you need to decompress the chest in the first place and see whether there's a, there actually is a hemothorax. So here, this is an example of, so here's the rib, here's a rib, and this line here is the pleura. And here's a patient that's breathing but normally when you breathe, this pleural line should kind of move back and forth, and this pleural line is not moving. So this is an example of a pneumothorax, what pneumothoraces pneumothor look like on ultrasound. This may be as a result of your trauma line, but this may be as a result of the patient having blunt force trauma. So you may want to, de well, in this case, you'd certainly want to decompress this, but you'd also be able to scan the other side and decide, decide whether or not you need to decompress the other side. And so ultrasound may have just saved you from doing an unnecessary procedure on the patient. So you've established your large wall access, you're starting to give some volume, whatever you have, you know, it may be crystalloid, you may be one of those luckily pre-hospital people that carry um, blood products, but you notice that when you assess the blood pressure, the blood pressure is 60 on 40. Now you're pretty confident that he's losing volume somewhere, but where, how can you find out? We scan the chest, we can look for a hemothorax, we can then scan the abdomen and scan the rest of him as well. And this is um, known as the HE-FAST exam. Um, this is extended focused abdominal sonography and trauma. It's now extended because it includes looking at the pleura and looking, um, I'm looking for um, hemothoraces, but mainly it's designed to looking in, for, in the abdomen for intra-abdominal bleeding. You may also find this. You may find that they've got, um, this is the subcostal view of the heart. So there's the left ventricle here, here's the right atrium. And here's this big black echo free space just around the heart. This is a large pericardial collection. And in this case, you'd be really worried about some kind of intra, um, intrathoracic bleed, but certainly whatever it's causing it, it's causing tamponade. And you might want to drain this. So you might either need to drain this or perform, uh, or perform an urgent pre-hospital um, clamshell thoracotomy to try and save this guy's life. You may not see that, you may see this. So here's the liver, here is the right kidney. And surrounding the liver and the kidney is stuff that shouldn't be there. This is big black stuff. So this is fluid. And this is likely in this scenario, somebody who's having an intra-abdominal bleed. So you may have ruptured some pelvic vessels, maybe bleeding into his abdomen. And therefore that needs, you need, you know, you need to replace the blood products, but you also want to try and arrest the hemorrhage. Now, how can we arrest the hemorrhage in the pre-hospital setting? Well, this is coming in more and more. Our good old friend Reboa, resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. And this involves um, cannulating the femoral artery and placing a small balloon catheter up into the uh, into the sending aorta and inflating it um, at varying levels, depending on where you think the bleeding is, to try and cause balloon tamponade and temporarily arrest bleeding, while allowing you to resuscitate the patient. Then you can get them to hospital and have definitive intervention, either surgery or interventional radiology. And yes, you guessed it, you can do ultrasound guided Reboa. Not only can you use, should you be using ultrasound to actually puncture the femoral vessel to place the catheter, but you can actually scan the aorta and work out the precise zone where you're going to be placing your Reboa. So if you're worried about a lower down hemorrhage and you want to place it in zone three, you just make sure that you, you make sure that you're um, below the celiac and super, superior mesenteric vessels. And if you want to go a little bit higher, you can actually scan the thoracic aorta using a supersternal view and place it a little bit higher, um, just, uh, just proximal or just distal to the origin of the left subclavian vessel. So all in all, we've been able to do quite a few things fairly rapidly at the patient side with ultrasound. So he's, remember, he's uptended, his GCS is low, we decided to intubate him. And I can see you're going, no, there's no way, there's absolutely no way ultrasound can help here. Well, it can. So here is your trachea. This thing here is the collapsed esophagus. And if you're intubating somebody, you can place a linear probe um, over the trachea. And what you're looking to see, if you intubate the esophagus, you get this sign. This is called, well, this is called the double barreled sign. And this is a sign that you've actually just put your tube completely in the wrong place and you've expanded the esophagus. Probably the fastest way of recognizing an esophageal intubation, and you actually see the double O sign before 
you see a change in cap or before you detect your capnography. So there are some people that are advocating for this, including the Difficult Airway Society or DAS. And after you've done your intubation, the other thing that you may want to do is assess the level of where your tube is, because you may have intubated them in a hurry. And as we all know, when you intubate people in a hurry, you tend to push the tube too far in and you may accidentally intubate the right main bronchus. Um, so you can assess the lung. So here is again, here's rib here, here's rib here. Here's the lung, that here's the pleural line. So here you can see the pleural line moving very nicely. But what you can actually do as a very quick and quick and easy guide to the appropriate tube depth, is you can actually intubate the person too far on purpose, put the probe on the left-hand side because you're more likely to intubate the right main bronchus. And if you've intubated them, if you intubated the right main stem, the left-hand side, the left-hand lung will not move, will not have that sliding feature. And you just pull the tube back while you ventilate the patient until the left lung starts sliding again. And then you know you're above the careen. That's a very, very nice, easy way um, in the pre-hospital environment to tell how deep your tube should be. And you can secure it down there. So we have been able to, we're sorting out the hemorrhage. We've intubated him. Now we want to work out his, we want to work out what's going on with D, with disability, to so work out whether he's got any, or whether he's got a significant head injury. Classically, what do we do? We use our eyes and we use pupils and we shine a light to the pupils, see whether they're reactive or not. And that's crude, it works. But with ultrasound, we can go a little bit deeper. We can actually assess intracranial pressure. This is something called optic nerve sheath diameter. So here is the globe, this is the eyeball. And just behind it here, this shadowy line here, this is actually the optic nerve. And what you're actually measuring, this distance here that's being measured is the distance of the optic nerve sheath. And there's some great data from both ultrasound and from MRI studies showing that the dimensions of this optic nerve sheath correlates with the intracranial pressure. And once the dimensions come, become above 55 or 60 millimeters, that's associated with an ICP of more than 20. And it's a very rapid, easy bedside test that can be done to rapidly rule in raised intracranial pressure. You can also go beyond that if you've got the skills and you can actually place a probe on the temporal bone just um, just over here where most people have a small window and it can actually look directly into the brain and perform what's called transcranial ultrasound. And here this is actually color Doppler and this is actually a patient's circle of Willis. Here's the middle cerebral artery, here's the posterior cerebral artery, here's the anterior communicating artery and if I could get a view here you'd actually be able to see the anterior cerebral arteries going up here. And you can actually sample the middle cerebral artery, which is classically the easiest one to do, and then get a nice waveform. And again, this waveform here gives you a huge amount of information about cerebral blood flow and tells you a little, a little bit of information about raised intracranial pressure, particularly the waveform patterns. So as your intracranial pressure goes up, your middle cerebral artery waveform starts to change, particularly your diastolic flow as you get an increased cerebral vascular resistance. So as your intracranial pressure goes higher and higher and higher, you lose your, cerebral, your, you lose your diastolic flow, eventually you start to get reversal of flow. And when you reach the point where your, your systolic flow and your diastolic flow are the same, are essentially the same amplitude, at that point, the net sum of your cerebral blood flow is zero. So these patients here, once you reach this point, this patient essentially has cerebral circulatory arrest and has such high intracranial, blood, um, high intracranial pressure, there's no cerebral blood flow. This is one of the reasons why this is used in many countries as an ancillary test for brainstem death. But in the pre-hospital environment, what you want is a quick, dirty view to see whether or not this patient has raised intracranial pressure so you can start managing the patient appropriately with head up tilt and potentially um, hypotonic solutions if you have that to hand. So that's a little quick summary of what we've been able to use ultrasound for in this trauma case. We've been able to attain vascular access, we've been able to assess injuries, been able to, we've been able to intubate, um, perform procedural guidance, get some hemorrhage control and assess intracranial pressure. But wait, there's more. So let's move on to another case. Here's the typical case that we may see. You may get cold, you may get a call from a house and you've got a 54 year old male who's had a fever, cough, shortness of breath for the last four days and he's called the ambulance because he's severely short breath. He's had a previous MI and he's got a smoker. This is the stuff that we know we've, we, we see these patients quite a few times. And here the differential diagnosis is pretty wide. He might be having another MI. Um, he's had a fever. He might be having pneumonia. He smokes a lot. He might have cancer. Who knows what's going on? But again, you'd normally be relying on your, on your hands and your eyes and the history and your stethoscope to try and work out what's going on and then work out what the right treatment is, whether that's antibiotics and fluids, or whether that's some diuretics or some CPAP, and then transfer him to the nearest appropriate institution. And if he's having an MI, then he might need to go to a cardiac center. So this is the kind of things that you, you know, you might see observations that look like this. So typical tachypneic, um, tachycardic, um, relatively preserved blood pressure, um, desaturating, needing quite a lot of high flow oxygen, 
but not much else to find. There's something wrong in the chest. How do you work out what it is? So here, this is going to be a little showcase for what lung ultrasound in particular can do. So here's a little reminder of what normal lung can look like. So you've got ribs here, you've got ribs here. Um, this is all anterior chest wall muscles. This bright line here is a pleural line. And if, if you, I don't know if you guys can see this here, but the pleural line kind of shimmers a little bit and it moves back and forth. And we call this lung sliding. Then you have this nice clear stuff underneath the pleural line. Um, the, um, and you can sometimes see these reverberation artifacts here. That This is called an A-line. This is essentially normal lung. It looks nice and clear and boring. When people start to get sick, you start to see weird things. So in our 54-year-old gentleman, you might see something like this when you look. So the, again, on the left, for reference, this is normal lung. And here you might see this. This is this big black stuff. This is all fluid. And this might be a large pleural effusion that he's been accumulating because of his undiagnosed lung cancer. And he might need to go to a hospital where he can get that drained and sampled so he can then have start work out what his cancer is and he can start getting therapy. You may also see this. So again, here, reminder, this is normal lung. And here you can see that there's the pleural line again moving around, but you can see these things here. You look like little comets coming off that pleural line. These are called B lines. And these B lines are associated with increased interstitial lung water. So here, if you see a pattern that looks like this um, all over the lung, this you have to worry about something like pulmonary edema, which is often the most common cause to get a pattern like that. And in that case, you then worry that he's got pulmonary edema and there's something wrong with his heart. And the treatment here is going to be treatment for heart type things. And he needs an ECG, but then you also have the ability to do an echo, which we'll talk about a little bit later. You might also see something like this. So again, remember, reminder, this is normal lung. And here you can see that this actually looks solid. And this actually looks like liver. So this is massively what we'd call hepatized lung. This is a massive consolidation. And this is somebody with really, really nasty chest infection. So this is an instant diagnosis of his pneumonia. And you'd want to start some antibiotics, maybe give him a little bit of fluid and make sure he gets to, you know, maybe make sure he gets to an ED where he can continue his antibiotic treatment and you know, be admitted to hospital and hopefully get all the right treatment to help his pneumonia get sorted. You may even be surprised to see something like this. So again, normal lung here. Do you, I don't know if you guys remember from the first slide or, or from the first case when we looked at that guy and he had no lung sliding. So here you've got, again, you've got that absence of shimmering. But if you look right here, every now and again, you see this little, you see this little thing just kind of appear that just kind of shoots in and out. So this is called a lung point. What you've got here is a point where here's normal lung that moves and here's not abnormal lung that doesn't move. So this is what this is a sign that is 100% specific for pneumothorax. So this patient has a 100% diagnosis of a pneumothorax, and that might be the reason why this guy suddenly becomes short of breath. And so in this case, you've seen this. He needs to go to he he needs to go to hospital and get a chest drain. Now, thankfully, we don't see this very much anymore. But it's something that two well yeah two years ago we saw a lot of. So here, this is, these are both abnormal lungs. You can see that here, you've got these rays coming off, these B lines coming off, but they look a bit different from the other one that I showed you. They don't look as regular. And here, the pleura looks a bit moth-eaten and weird. So this is called interstitial syndrome. And then in this case, with this irregular interstitial syndrome with areas of sparing bilaterally, this is a classical appearance of, well, most recently, a viral pneumonitis. And this patient actually had COVID. And this is what COVID looks like on lung ultrasound. And we did a lot of work. Well, certainly, I did a lot of work um, two, three, um, two years ago, scanning lots of people with COVID with lung ultrasound, trying to work out what it looked like and what the evolution was. And there was some really great work showing that actually lung ultrasound was actually pretty good for diagnosing COVID. You can also then supplement all of this, you know, if you all your lung ultrasound by doing a quick scan of the heart. So if you've got a patient who's got those B lines and you're not sure whether those B lines are because they've got an infection or because they've got something wrong with their heart, you can just have a quick look at the heart. Here's a left atrium, here's a left ventricle, here's the aortic valve, here's a mitral valve. And here you can see that this heart, unlike the other one that I showed you earlier, this heart's barely squeezing. I mean, for some of you, this might actually look like a still image because normally a heart should kind of move like this. This heart's not emptying at all. So this patient, if they had respiratory failure like that, um, with um, with wet looking lungs like that and a heart that looks like this, this patient has heart failure. And again, they need to go to hospital. Just as a comparator, to remind you what a normal heart should look like, this is a normal heart. And you can see that it contracts really nicely. The walls kind of meet together really, really nicely. and just looks kind of vigorous and healthy. So this is stuff that you can actually see very, very, re relatively easy. and doesn't take a lot of time or training. For people who are interested in lung ultrasound, this is a wonderful um, algorithm that was created by the 
the person we call the godfather of Long Island Sound, a chap called Daniel Lichtenstein, and he designed this base, this decision tree called the Blue Protocol that allows you to work out in a breathless patient um, based on the different signs that you have, what kind of disease they have. And you, he, you can pick up um, six main diseases. You've got the obstructive diseases, asthma, COPD, pick up pulmonary emboli, pneumonia, pulmonary edema, and pneumothorax. So ultrasound is actually really powerful in the differential diagnosis and differentiated respiratory failure. And when Daniel Lichtenstein initially published his data and also followed up by a chap called, Vol an Italian chap called um, Volpicelli, they both showed that your ability to get the correct diagnosis using long ultrasound approaches is about 90% in skilled hands. So approaching the accuracy of CT, vastly outstripping the diagnostic accuracy of chest x-ray. When, when you add echo, it makes it even more accurate. Brings us on to another case. So again, you called, you called to see somebody at home, a 70-year-old lady who's fallen forward onto her forearm. She's got excruciating pain in her forearm with limited movement. Well, you think to yourself, well, ultrasound doesn't really have any role here. I just need to make sure her arm supported. I can tell clinically that she's got a fracture or not. And then I can either tell her to go see her GP or go to the hospital. Well, why guess when you can know? So this is a this is a linear probe looking detail at the distal radius and the proximal radius. And here you can see that there's a step in the bone. And congratulations, in two seconds, you just diagnosed the Collie's fracture in this woman. And ultrasound is actually remarkably accurate for diagnosing long bone fractures. And it's very, very good for looking at rib fractures, um, limb fractures, and all sorts. Um, you can even see skull fractures with, or with ultrasound, particularly in young people. And not only that, she's mentioned she's in excruciating pain, um, with a little bit of, if you've got some lig if you've got some lignocaine on you, you can actually perform some regional anesthesia while you transfer her to the hospital. So this is the axillary artery, and here's a needle. Um, and here you can see these bunches of breaks here. These are the nerves of the brachial plexus, and you can basically surround the axillary artery with some local anesthetic and provide a very nice brachial plexus block, and that will basically numb most of her arm from her from her bicep downwards and make her really really nice and comfortable. So ultrasound can be very useful in the management of musculoskeletal injuries as well. There's still more. So now we're going to talk about ultrasound and its role in cardiac arrest. So this is my strong area of interest. So we've got a 63-year-old female who's sudden, sudden onset chest pain and collapse, and you've got bystander CPR ongoing. So you get there, you attach the paddles, and what you first see is a squiggly line, and it looks like asystole. So you're about to proceed down the right-hand side of the ALS algorithm of asystole and just give adrenaline. Why not have a look with your with your probe? Because now you've got the skills and we've been talked about it. You can have a look. You see something like this. So you may not be able to see that. I'm not sure how well this shows up. So initially, again, this looks like a still image of the heart. But if you look really, really closely, particularly at the valves here. So this is the same image I keep showing you, the parasitic long axis view, left ventricle here, mitral valve is here, left atrium is here, aortic valve is here. So you see the aortic valve is not opening. So the patient's in the rest. But if you look really, really closely at the mitral valve, it's actually shimmering like this, this patient's actually in fine ventricular fibrillation. And you can pick that up and you can shock them. And that moves you back on to a more survivable, um, much better side of the algorithm and allows you to give them appropriate treatment and may actually get them better. This, these images come courtesy of my friend, Peter Sharon. So while you've done the shock, you start chest compressions again. Again, you can have a look at the heart while the chest compressions are going on. So this is chest compressions with a Lucas device. So again, this all looks this all looks a bit like, like a bit of a mess. So this is a costal view. Here's the right side of the heart. Here's the left side of the heart. And everything just kind of looks like it's bouncing around. But if you look really, really closely, one of the things that you really want, the whole point of your chest compressions is to try and compress the left ventricle. Here, the left ventricle is down here underneath, and the left ventricle is not being compressed. So this is actually an ineffective placement of a Lucas device. And what you want to do is move the Lucas device around. So my friend, Peter, um, he works in the pre-hospital space. He actually moved this patient's Lucas around. And on this image here, you can now see that the left ventricle here is actually now compressed and is now being bounced up and down. It's actually now being compressed properly. And this is, a, this is now actually much better associated with ROSC. You, whenever you do this, you will usually see a rise in end-tidal CO2. You may see an increase in diastolic blood pressure if you've got, a blood, if you've got an arterial line in. And this has been associated with an increased ROSC. And I will show you the data for that in a second. But before I show you that, I will show you where that data came from and an exciting new development in cardiac arrest 
which may be coming to the hospital space. This is using trans esophageal echo. Or well, this is an American group, so this is trans esophageal echo because they don't believe in diphthongs. Um, the research TE group led by a guy called Philippe Terran is exploring the role of using trans esophageal imaging in cardiac arrest. The reason why I do that is because you get much clearer pictures. So you put a you put a big probe into the esophagus. Um, you cannot, if you've got somebody in cardiac arrest pre-hospitally, you might be doing advanced airways, so you might be intubating people, and you can pop you can pop this probe in at the same time, and you get beautiful clear images like this. So this is the left ventricle here, this is the mitral valve, this is the left atrium, and you can see things really, really clearly. Felipe did a lot of the work on this area of looking at of this area of looking at the area of maximum compression during cardiac arrest and showing that it's associated with increased survival. So here is See if you can hear this. The image here shows a mid-esophageal lung access key of the heart that allows us to assess the LV, the LVO key and the aorta. As you can see here, the point of maximal compression is right over the LVO key, which is obstructed throughout most of the- I'm gonna drop the volume down for a second. So Felipe is talking and here you can see a patient in cardiac arrest and chest compressions are gonna be coming from here because this is the anterior surface and here, the LVOT is over here, the left ventricle is here, and these are ineffective compressions because the aortic valve is not opening. So this patient here, this is not associated with survival. Whereas if I fast forward a little bit more, so here, if you now look really closely here, the whole, the heart is now being compressed a little bit better. The aortic valve is now opening and that's very key. And here, this patient went from being unshockable um, to having an organized rhythm. And this is, for those people who are interested, this is Felipe's data, which he published in October 2022. This is initial pilot data of a large group, the international group, looking at the use of TOE in cardiac arrest, or TE in cardiac arrest. And they have shown a strong association, association between the area of maximal compression and survival. Further work's going to be coming out soon, so watch the space or message Felipe if you're interested in being part of this exciting development. Which brings me on to one of my strong areas of interest, the idea of extracorporeal life support. So in some people, say you've got this lady here, you've shocked her many times, and she's still, she's 54, um, she's got no other major past medical history, and she's still in refractory VF or VT, she's the kind of person who you would consider for the most advanced life support of all, which is using ECMO or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation to provide flow and support her heart while you treat the underlying cause, which is usually some kind of ischemic event. And so I don't know if any of you have seen this picture. So this is the Louvre, and this is a group in Paris called the SAMU group. And they are actually putting somebody on ECMO on the floor in the Louvre. Um, is this associated with survival? Well, if you're interested in this stuff, there's this great paper that was published a couple of years ago called The Arrest Trial by a group in Minnesota. And they showed a, they, where they have instituted a an, an pre-hospital eCPR program or extracorporeal CPR program. And they showed a significant change in survival. They actually had to stop this trial early because I think it was something like seven out of 10 of the people that they had in their eCPR survived and nobody in the control arm survived. So a significant change survival, not just survival, survival with new, to um, being neurologically intact. So my bias here is that my teammates at BART are actually doing are uh, mostly through a trial um, called the sub 30 trial, looking at the possibilities of doing ECPR on the streets of London. So I'll just fast forward you to this bit. So these are my colleagues, Simon Finney and, um, and Ben Singer. Um, this is a moulage where they're just kind of showing you how it's done. So the patient's collapsed or we imagine the patient's collapsed and they are using, the patient's got a Lucas device on, somebody's managing the airway. They've got all their ECMO kit out and they will be using ultrasound or Simon is currently using ultrasound to assess the vessels. And then he's going to be using ultrasound to provide a puncture and place both on arterial and venous sheath followed by, and following that by putting very, very large bore pipes in. So 25 French and um, 25 or 23 French um, venous cannula and, a, and often a 17 or 19 French arterial cannula. And they'll place, they'll place the patient essentially on portable cardiac bypass. And that's what ECMO does. And so ultrasound is absolutely key in providing eCPR. 
You need it for vascular access. You need it to assess the heart and decide whether or not you know work out patient's got a shockable or non-shockable rhythm. And then use it afterwards to look to assess the heart for myocardial recovery. So this is just um, this is just an example of what it looks like. The sheets going in. Um, Simon here was using a portable wireless ultrasound um, device um, with um, that was attached to Google Glass, so you could actually see the images on his glasses. And then what you're looking to see. Let me just go back one. And then what you're looking to see. One of the important thing about the ultrasound. So this is the inferior vena cava. And this is the aorta, and you use ultrasound. And ultrasound is absolutely key to make sure that you've cannulated and you've put the wires in the right place. Because you can imagine the patient's in cardiac arrest, everything's bouncing up and down, and it's very, very easy to cannulate the artery thinking of the vein and the vein thinking of the artery. So being able to control your wires with ultrasound is absolutely crucial. So in summary, ultrasound is absolutely fantastic and really, really useful um, for diagnostic and procedural in cardiac arrest. That's a little summary of where I thought, what I think ultrasound can do in the um, pre-hospital space. But what about what's coming next? What's in the future? Well, remember I showed you the machines are small, but the machines are small and they're not without, they are smaller and they're not losing power. If anything, they're gaining power. So this is something that we never used to be able to see on a portable device. And this is, this is Doppler. This is actually pulse wave Doppler. And the portable devices are now basically able to do all the same things that the big massive devices that we support that we um, that we trundle around the hospital can do so you're not losing anything by using a smaller device in the pre-hospital space ai is coming you know you've probably already seen all the stuff in the news about how the makers of ai are are lamenting it because of the rise of things like bard and chat gpt and how they think it's going to destroy the world and we're on the verge of skynet uh, skynets and stuff like that but it's still applicable in ultrasound because the AI is actually getting better in reading the images. So here is some great work by um, a guy called Robin Arnfield from Canada, um, looking at using AI to actually analyze lung ultrasound and work out. So remember I talked about B lines earlier and how they, they can appear in both pulmonary edema and in some kinds of infections and, and viral pneumonias. Well, using AI, um, the AI tool is much more sensitive and much more specific at telling you what um, is causing your beeline profile um, and actually completely destroys clinicians and the, the accuracy of the AI approaches 100%. It's quite impressive. And the AI models are getting better and better. Most, lots of the ultrasound machines now have AI built within them. They'll be able to tell you where, what you're looking at, how to scan, um, what to, and they'll be able to measure stuff for you. So this is all coming very soon. These are advanced measures of of echocardiography. So ultrasound is now able to measure lots and lots of really cool things that we never could do before. So this is something called strain echocardiography, which basically looks in detail at regional movement. So you're able to completely accurately identify things like regional wall motion abnormalities at a level that we never could before. That means you can basically work out whether people are having MIs or people have global dysfunction and stuff like that really, really easily. We've also got this. So this is 3D echocardiography. And the machines are now getting so powerful that this is something that maybe that can easily be coming to portable handheld devices that we can have. And we can see that um, on both um, transthoracic or transesophageal echocardiography. This is another cool development. This is contrast enhanced ultrasound. So you can squirt in a little bit of contrast intravenously, and then you can scan the patient and you can watch things fill or not fill. And this is this is gaining traction, particularly in the trauma space, um, because you can use it to identify intra-abdominal sources of bleeding. So you've got a liver laceration, um, you may be able to see the contrast extravasates and ditto with kidneys and things like that, and you can use that to track where people are bleeding from. This is something that's really, really cool that's been around for a little while. So remember the transcranial ultrasound I talked about a little bit earlier? Well, you can identify strokes on transcranial ultrasound. Not only can you identify strokes, you can then use high frequency ultrasounds to try and disrupt the clot. And this is something that's been coming for a little while, the idea of sonal thrombolysis. So both diagnostic diagnosis and rapid treatment of your stroke pre-hospitally with an ultrasound probe. Um, the data, I think this is all still in trials. I think they've gone to phase three stuff um, that, um, that's coming at the moment, but this is pretty exciting. The idea of so this is this is something that's really cool. This is called this is from Philips. This is so uh, this is um their software called Reacts, and this is essentially telemonitoring and telemonitoring using ultrasound. 
So no longer do you actually need the skills. You can scan the patient and in real time, you can communicate your findings with, a, with an expert, you know, miles away, wherever they are. And they can look at stuff, tell you to move the probe left and right, up and down. And they can tell you what the diagnosis is and tell you what to do. And that makes training and governance so easy now. This is um, remote medicine, um, remote, um, remote practitioners. I've been using this for a while now and it's been working really, really well. And this is, I'm an intensivist, just a reminder, or this is just a reminder to everyone that there is now, now increasing recommendations because the devices are so powerful now and the information you can get is so strong, there is an increasing set of recommendations that it should become part and parcel of what we do, similar to using the stethoscope. So these are um, two articles from the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, where they both essentially, they were both recommending, first of all, drawing out what they think the skills that people should have. And the second one um, saying that ultrasound is now, is now an accepted part of the, of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine um, ICM training curriculum. And this is a reminder, so I work in the UK and in the UK, emergency medicine, emergency medicine has ultrasound as part of the curriculum already and has a set of competencies that you're supposed to learn. Um, and I think for emergency medicine, it's heart, lung, um, DVT, um, focus abdominal sonography and trauma, and some degree of vascular access. Whilst for intensive care medicine, it's heart, lung, abdomen, vascular access, and neurosonography is recommended as our basic. So I'm hoping that many of you have reached this point and are going, okay, this is great. How do I learn? If, you, if you're in the UK, there's a number of different people that, that um, can train you. So um, I, again, big conflict of interest here. So I work and I'm part of the FUSIC committee. And, and FUSIC of ultrasound and intensive care runs a number of different training programs and it's modular. We cover heart, lung, abdomen, vascular access with incoming modules in airway ultrasound, neuro ultrasound, um, regional ultrasound. Um, the British Society of Echocardiography manages ECHO. The Australian Society of Ultrasound and Medicine also runs a bunch of different um, accreditation programs. So for people who are in Australia, you might want to look at that. And the ESIC, the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine has a bunch of programs as well. And this is what we cover in FUSIC. So for people who are interested, um, there's the link. Um, and please check us out. Um, our training program is quite nice. Ultrasound is not without its pitfalls. Big thing to remember is it's a machine. It's not going to treat the patient for you. It's not going to replace your brain. You still have to take a history, do an examination and be a good doctor. This is a tool that can help you be a better doctor, but this is not going to do the medicine or, or sorry, not just doctors because we have lots of different practitioners, but it's not going to do the caring and deliver the care for you. You have to be a good clinician and use your brain. Just a little reminder, it's what I started to talk about. I said at the end that I could take you that ultrasound can go through the whole body. I hope I've demonstrated that it can. And this is my little summary slide and just a reminder of the two sides, the yin and the yang of ultrasound. On the one hand, the light side, it's really powerful. It can tell you lots and lots of stuff. But on the dark side, fool with a tool is still a fool. It's only as good as its use. Just to finish a few references. Um, so my conflict here is I know some of the authors of these books um, and they're good friends. Um, I think Luke actually wrote the book on the right might actually be in the audience. Um, so please check out these books if you're a textbook person. Um, they're great and they're wonderful intros. Um, if you want to look at some websites, there's lots of free material that you can use to start learning ultrasound on the internet. Um, YouTube is actually just full of stuff. Um, here's some great websites that I think are like kind of good starters for 10. And if you're interested in learning some more advanced stuff, um, we're actually running a, an advanced echo course in July where I'll be talking about lots of this kind of stuff. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Jacqueline, that was absolutely phenomenal. What a, uh, what a trip through the entire body. I certainly learned things that I, I didn't know before. Um, can I invite everybody to um, place questions in the chat or put your hands up? Um, whoever is iPhone 226, you've uh, direct messaged me to say thank you. I'll pass it on to, to Shakes as well. Um, and while we wait for questions to come through, um, I think I'll uh, ask you uh, myself. I've got a couple actually. Um, the first is about neuro ultrasound. Um, 
Now that's uh, a, a fascinating thing. I've got a special interest in traumatic brain injury, um, and I'm an I'm an emergency medicine consultant. So, um, how do you think that I could um, place neuro ultrasound into my practice that would help my patients? Now. That's a really interesting question. I'll be honest, as an EM consultant, you're likely going to be the trauma team leader and going to be managing these patients. So I personally don't think it's a job for you. And also I've been to, I've worked at Royal London. You guys have got rapid access to CTs that are right next door. So a lot of the stuff that you need um, in the initial management of your TBI patient, you can answer with CT. Where this stuff comes in, was particularly what you want to know is, where's the injury? Is the, you know, are the, have they got objective evidence of raging cranial pressure? And those things, I think you can answer straightforward with CT. However, where point of care ultrasound comes in is in the fine tuning of it. So I, I am but a novice. Um, the people who are brilliant at it are the people in Italy. So Chiara Robba in particular is an absolute master of this. And they're doing things like, you know, looking at cerebrovascular reactivity and working out whether there's, whether autoregulation is preserved or not by looking at the reaction of color Doppler and therefore fine tuning their hemodynamic management and their ventilation in order to maximize cerebral perfusion. And they're using it in combination with, of course, more advanced imaging like CT and with intracranial monitoring. Um, so I think for traumatic brain injury point of view, where for the initial management, if you've got CT nearby, not really useful. If you don't have CT nearby or you need, or you need, um, or you're, there's something going on, there's gonna be a break, or there's gonna be time delay in getting to CT, this can actually be your friend. Mm. So I work in ECMO patients and every now and again, we have a, a, an ECMO patient that um, that has some pupillary, some pupillary abnormalities and I've been able to pick up um, massively raised intracranial pressure in seconds at the bedside before CT. Brilliant. So I'm hearing really useful in the, in the sicker end of the traumatic brain injured patients, maybe less useful in the milder TBI yeah. patients. Yeah, I think that, I think, it's all about the quite the right question you want to ask for fine tuning to where it's at. Yeah. Remote sites can't get to CT. Brilliant. Otherwise, they've just presented and you, your CT is next door. Don't waste your time. Bam. I'm going to then pass a question on from Nick Sillett, who we know uh, as one of our previous students. What are your thoughts on IVC collapsibility and focus? That's a whole nother lecture and a whole massive rant. Um, <laughs> the long, long and short of it, the IVC works at extremes. So it tells you the patient's massively preload dependent. So if it's slit like, and it tells you the patient's volume overloaded, anything in between, it can't help you. So it's not a fuel tank. It's a direct monitor of right atrial pressure and right atrial pressure poorly correlates with intravascular volume. So use it for what it's designed to be used for. Great, great answer. Um, right, scrolling down. Um... Do you think there's a role? I think I know the answer to this question. Do you think there's a role for focus in rural general practice? Absolutely. Um, so um, there are lots of my friends. I have quite a few friends who do focus in um, kind of rural Australia and they swear by it. They think it's absolutely brilliant. So um, their need for they don't need x-rays because they diagnose all their fractures. Um, they diagnose heart failure, pneumonias, renal, renal stones, bowel obstruction, you name it. Sometimes it's the only tool they have. Um, you know, they do, they use focus in space. That's what NASA uses to diagnose their astronauts. So mm -hmm. in, in this setting, and I know that there's a growing, not just local group in the UK, but growing international community of GPs that are doing focus and are learning how to do this and are providing essentially their one-stop diagnostics in their clinics. So I think this is a huge area that is just about to explode, especially now that we're struggling with hospital capacity and there's a move towards hospital at homes. So yes, definitely useful. I think absolutely right. I mean, with the, with the enormous strain that the urgent emergency care system is under, primary care waiting a long time, waiting a long time for a primary care appointment then waiting a long time for a test that primary care organizes, it makes perfect sense. And even as a as a tool to diagnose a range of abdominal pains, the other one that wasn't that um that is on there is uh, biliary stones and cholecystitis. It's hugely important. Absolutely. So that's a great question, and that was from Daniel Grace. So thank you, Daniel. Um, looking down, I think there's a bit of chat. Is there an accredited? So Steve P says, is there an, an accredited logbook for focus available? Have you got a recommendation for how trainees should log the scans they do 
So if you're an EM trainee, I know that the EM, um, what EM has changed in terms from um, requiring a logbook to what's called entrustment. So it's now considered just part of practice. So um, in that respect, um, a logbook is no longer necessary. However, you can keep your own logbook if you want to with an Excel file or whatever. If you are training in one of the other modalities like Fusic, for instance, Fusic mandates a logbook. Or your because you have to submit a logbook of a certain number of cases at the end of your fusic training, and pass a um, and pass a triggered assessment. So the answer to that is it depends on what your training modality is. Um, there are online logbooks for that you can keep for your own learning and for your own benefit. Um, so I did so I did advanced BSE training, so I had to do 250 cases in, in over about 18 months. Um, that's quite excessive. Um, but everybody, if you want to keep a logbook for yourself, um, feel free. I think also some of those handheld ultrasound machines that you showed have got really great um, kind of governance um, aware um, applicability so you can save scans and you can you don't have to put the patient's name in and nobody's really recognizable from an ultrasound scan so that's another you can just keep a log within the software if you're lucky enough to have one of those yeah absolutely the butterfly I think the butterfly does it really well as does the um, the cosmos Econus. Um I don't have any interest in either device. I was going. I, I was avoiding the question of which is your favourite handheld device, so we won't go there. No um, yeah, exactly. Um, how should how should trainees gain um, experience in echo and cardiac arrest situations without impairing patient outcomes? That's from S. So this is a great question because there. So this is. I think this re relates to ILCO. So ILCO have actually recommended against point of care ultrasound in cardiac arrest for precisely that situation. Um, there are two answers to this. So one is there is a protocol called the CASA protocol, which is designed precisely to eliminate and eliminate the interruptions to chest compressions while performing um, while performing echo. And so this is designed to make sure that you use echo during your pulse check. And there is a system in place of getting the machine ready. Um, as soon as the pulse check starts, you get yourself you, you know you get yourself in position before the pulse check. As soon as the pulse check starts, you get your view. You record a quick ten second loop and hands off the chest, and then you review your, you review your ten second loop. But as much as I like that, my problem with that is it's not continuous. So my real interest, and I think in intra arrest, we should be going the transesophageal route because you stick the probe down and it stays there the whole time, mm -hmm. and you just do it at the start. And if Felipe's data continues to hold true, that it it does guide and improve your cardiac arrest management by improving your area of maximal compression, we will reach a point where for true advanced cardiac arrest care, we, we will be using TOE routinely. The challenge then is going back to the device manufacturers and making sure that they can provide us with robust, minimally expensive TOE probes that we can deploy rapidly in cardiac arrest. And yeah. I throw that, if there's any device manufacturer listening, I throw that out to you now. I'm sure that we'll start to see the handheld TOEs come in the next decade as these applications become more and more relevant. And that brings us on to a question. What um, kind of supra, supra sternal views do you like, if any? Um, the answer is it depends. And I look, I look at lots. So I routinely do supra sternal to look at the um, to look at the aortic arch because it's part of the BSE. It start as part of the BSE minimum data set. But from a supersternal view, you can also assess the super, superior vena cava and the brachiocephalic trunk. So sometimes I use that when I'm looking, when I'm doing things like central lines and I want to look at where my central line is. Sometimes you can look at SVC collapsibility. So the answer is whatever I'm looking at. Perfect. Brilliant. We've got two more questions from the group and then I'm going to pass over to Tim. The first one is, is there any application for ultrasound um, looking at the uh, optic nerve in patients with headache? Yes, um, benign intracranial hypertension. So there's lots of, actually a lot of the initial data on the accuracy of ultra optic nerve sheath diameter was done in people with BIH. And what you can do is you can measure their optic nerve sheath, you can do their therapeutic lung puncture and measure it again, and watch it shrink. So mm -hmm. yes, it works really, really well. Um, so the, the other thing that ultrasound can be really, really useful for is there are, so not just optic nerve sheath, transcranial ultrasound as a whole, can be helpful in the differential diagnosis of headache because you can see things like, um, you, so you can diagnose things like um, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, aka yeah. hypertensive um, emergency, um, yeah. by looking at cerebral blood flows. Um, you can pick up strokes. Um, not great for other things, for things like migraines, but yeah, but your big things are strokes, space occupying lesions, and things like press. You can pick up. 
um mm. and it's so and it's quite useful um also if you've got pregnant women with a headache um if you see as elevated velocities transcranial velocities you worry about preeclampsia mm -hmm. oh that's brilliant what a list i think it's probably helpful to say you can contradict me that uh, very often ultrasound is an absolutely brilliant rule in tool but the absence of a diagnosis does that mean that it's not there I 100% agree with that, especially when we're using it at the point of care. When mm. you train really, really hard and you get really, really good, then, you know, ultrasound becomes both a rule in and a rule out. Mm. But at the point of care level, most of us are not, you know, most of us are not radiologists or cardiologists. We don't live and do this all the time. So mm. when you're starting out, be safe. And it's just a rule in, you know, you see, you, you see something, you call it, you don't see it. It doesn't mean it's not there. You get somebody else to have a look. Perfect. And then the final question is, can you recommend any specific courses for clinicians keen to improve their pre-hospital care for frail patients with heart failure, lung infections, DVTs, et cetera? So not intensivist necessarily directed courses, but you know, for that huge population of frailer patients with new symptoms. So interestingly enough, a lot of the, the stuff that we do at the Fusic level actually covers a lot of the stuff because it's designed for whole for everyone. And it's the same, it's the same diseases and the same stuff that you look at for everyone. Um, there's also something very similar that the, the Society of Acute Medicine does called FAMOUS, Focus Acute Medicine Ultrasound, which is the same syllabus. Um, so those are both courses that you can do that are accredited. Um, they set you up with a logbook, they get you a supervisor, because the big thing, again, one of the big things to talk about when you're training is it's like learning and it's learning a new skill. You need a mentor and somebody to kind of teach you, teach, show you the ropes, get you scanning. I'll give you tips and pointers you go back to them and you keep scanning and you just keep practicing as the more you practice you get better and that's what your logbook is really for it's a guidebook of mentored practice so it's about making sure you join a community of practice and you get mentored and you work your way through it so those two accreditations certainly in the uk i'd highly recommend as ways to join that community and start practicing and get your logbook and get signed off that's brilliant shags thank you so much there are no more questions in the chat um but that was so informative so i can't thank you enough um, I'm going to hand over to Tim now, who's going to tell us uh, a little bit about uh, Queen Mary and some of the master's programmes that we run. Tim just needs to unmute. Sorry, it wouldn't unmute while I was uh, sharing my screen for some reason. I will just go back to share the screen. Um, Segs, thank you so much. That was absolutely awesome as always. And Ban, thank you for your um, chairmanship and questions. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to talk to you briefly about some programmes we run. And I'll say at the outset, ultrasound is a big part of these, um, partly because I have a pathological addiction to ultrasound for all the reasons that sex has just outlined. It is a fantastic diagnostic tool. In patients with shock, it is probably the single most useful tool because it can help you outline the etiology, which of course will direct your management. So Ben and I work at Queen Mary and we run a series of master's programmes um, the three I'm going to briefly mention now is the Emergency and Resuscitation Programme, the Tactical Military Austere Programme and the Paediatric Programme. So Queen Mary is a member of the Russell Group. That is a group of the 16 perhaps most respected universities in the UK. It's a huge institution, 27,000 students, 160 countries. It's been constantly highly rated worldwide for research, particularly in medicine. And that beautiful building that you can see on the slide of front of you is at the blizzard is the <laughs> blizzard institute uh, i think it is a magnificent building if you look inside you can see a large bubble these bubbles are organelles and that building is the cell in the top of the building we have um, people running administration and academics and below ground level we have a lab which is an absolutely unique mix of laboratory staff basic sciences and clinical sciences and it's a privilege to work there so the faculty for these masters involves Ben, who runs the, the, the clever stuff like reading papers, statistics. And we start off with our first module to teach you how to read papers. Tessa Davis, who you may know from um, her multitude of Twitter and uh, 
foam stuff, um, runs paediatrics. Paul Rees, who's an unusual mix of military, cardiology, and pre-hospital, um, runs our cardiology. Libby runs our vertical integrated um, human factors curriculum. Libby's works at Queen Mary and King's, and her main interest is um, in simulation. Stephen Thomas is a professor of emergency medicine at Harvard and um, Beth Israel, and he runs our year three. Chet Trevedi um, has an interest like Daryl in snake bite. Both of them are, are, are PhD researchers, and they run our trauma module and module three. So why would you come and study emergency and resuscitation? Well, many people around the world would argue that this is a subspecialty interest, just as ultrasound is a subspecialty interest and toxicology is a subspecial interest. The skills that we need in the resus room are unique. They're difficult to acquire. The resus room is somewhere between 0.4 and 2% of patients, depending on where you ask, but it takes a disproportionate amount of time and both intellectual and procedural skills. We're not here to you, the master's isn't here to teach you how to be a researcher. It's to teach you to develop that subspecialty interest, to develop leadership, to develop teaching roles, but above all, to make you a better clinician. The Tactical Military Arnostia MSc is very similar to the emergency and resuscitation masters, but replaces one of the modules with a module that focuses on care on the battlefield and in remote and austere environments, such as in jungle, in mountains, uh, and at extremes of temperature. The faculty is drawn worldwide. Um, if you, if you look at the top three, Libby comes from King's, that, that's Chris Carbell, who is a world expert on PE and Professor of Emergency Medicine at Harvard. Next, you've got uh, Brian Burns from Life in the Fast Lane and Resus Me, based in Sydney. Uh, then Gareth Davis, you'll know from London Hems. Then we've got Mauricio Ciccioni, who's president or ex-president now of the European Society of Intensive Care, and so on. Um, and these people we are incredibly grateful for, for donating their expertise and skills as lectures and tutors. I'm not going to run over each one because it takes too long. Now, this master's was developed following my time in intensive and pre-hospital care, it was clear that we had an incredible group of paramedics who simply were not offered the opportunity to stretch their skills. It was also apparent to me that there were a number of doctors that were very interested in resuscitation, be that in pre-hospital care or the ED, and simply you know, there's only so much time you can train for. And I, I went and did a, a fellowship in emergency medicine and a fellowship in intensive care and paediatrics. But you know, that was six extra years training and not everybody shares my personality disorder. So I tried to take some of those skills and integrate them into the masters. Now, we want the masters to be interprofessional. By that, I mean, we want doctors, nurses, and paramedics. You will all be taught and assessed to the same standards, um, but we want that interprofessional group. It adds something to the master. We get to understand each other's um, perspective and what each of us brings to the resuscitation. Now, this is entirely online. You can study with us from anywhere in the world. The, there are eight modules, four in year one, four in year two. We have a year one and a year tutorial every Thursday. The tutorials are all online. Each week, we release somewhere between three and six lectures. They're between 20 and 60 minutes. So you're looking for anywhere between 90 minutes to three or four hours of lectures. Um, double that for the reading and exercise time that you'd be expected to do. Each of the modules focuses on one area of resuscitation. So we start with module one, which is looking at literature searching, sourcing knowledge and how to read a paper. We then come into module two, which looks at the pathophysiology of shock and the tools of resuscitation. Module three looks at cardiac arrest and airway. Module four looks at um, a variety of medical conditions that underpin shock and treatment, COPD, asthma, renal failure, cardiac disease. Now, that is the end of year one. The 
year one and year two also see an integrated vertical curriculum. So week eight of each of the modules involves some teaching around communication and simulation and human factors in emergency medicine. And that is led by Libby. Libby also leads our summer school, uh, which is a mixture of human factors training, simulation, a range of speakers, and of course, some trips around London to various pubs and restaurants. In year two, we move on to look at special areas such as the emergency management of trauma in number five, then the diagnostic tools. And guess what? Diagnostic tools is about 60% ultrasound. And after Seg's excellent talk, I think you'll begin to understand why. But we also, of course, cover ECGs and blood gases. In module seven, we look at toxicology and C by RN. And in module eight, you can choose to study either pediatric resuscitation or pre-hospital care and mess casualties. In year three we move on to a scientific paper. This replaces the dissertation because most of our students wanted to graduate with a, a something that was useful to them in enhancing their career and since most of them did not go on and do a PhD what was useful to them was to focus on an area of interest to produce a scientific paper for publication and a presentation they could take to conference so that is your year three outcome now most masters are two one or two years we put this one over three years because most of our students work full-time and work in emergency services and therefore they are working odd hours odd times weekends nights and evenings and we needed to give them time to study and integrate what they learn into practice we are truly international. Somewhere between a quarter and third of our students are outside the UK and span every continent. So our entry requirements are a basic medical, nursing, paramedic uh, degree. We like you to have two to three years experience. Now for some paramedics where their clinical experience was integrated into their degree, we are happy to consider you early on. Some paramedics and some nurses were never given the opportunity to get a basic undergraduate degree. So we consider those applications on a case by case um, count. And things we're looking for for doctors and uh, sorry for nurses and paramedics without an undergraduate degree is more clinical experience, typically three to five years, a dedication to lifelong learning. So conferences, uh, courses, lectures and leadership roles that you've taken. Our assessments are a mixture of written assessments. That's um, 1500 to 2000 words short or short answer assessment or a critical answer paper or an oral presentation. Most of the modules are also assessed by an MCQ to test basic knowledge. And the reason we have a multimodal assessment is different students offer different skills. And of course, assessments are there to train you. We need to train you to write, train you to talk and train you to think. So. I would thank you very much for listening to this short presentation. And if any of you have any questions about the masters, you can um, ask them now, type them, or you can contact me. I realize I haven't put my email. I will put my email in the address, uh, sorry, in the um, chat while I take any questions. So I thank you very much for your time and attention. And if you have any questions, please ask them now. Thanks, Tim. No, no questions. But um, if I can add, um, it's a real pleasure teaching on on these courses, um, and the, the mix between um, how should we put it the the mix of professional origins, paramedics, nurses, and doctors makes it absolutely fab to to teach on, and I think also it makes it really great to be a student on because you get these completely different perspectives. We also have students from all over the world, so you get perspectives from uh, medical environments with hugely varying levels of uh, levels of facilities, um, and all this um, means that the evidence base that we have to, to base our student practice on is just fantastic. 
We've got a question from Danny who says, I'm a graduate medical student at Barts currently. Do you have any advice for getting into emergency medicine from an early stage? Do you want to take that, Tim? Would you like me to take that? Uh, ben, if you start, I'm just typing another direct to me question so I can answer that question while you, you do the one you've just verbalised. Yeah, absolutely, Danny. So um, if you still have the capacity to do a special study module in emergency medicine, then you absolutely should, should try and do that. Um, if you can wangle your, uh, your F2 year to include emergency medicine, you should absolutely do that. Try and um get your courses up to date and if you were to choose to do this master's program then that would be very that would that would strengthen your application significantly as well i'm sure um where where do you work right now are you where are we in the year may so presumably you're about to enter a summer holiday and then start an f1 job in august maybe um Justine says, I've just finished my dissertation on the resuscitation master and I've loved it so much. Highly recommend it. So there you go. Thank you very much, Justine. We didn't pay you. Um, sorry, I'm Danny. Um, so I'm quite early on. I'm just finishing my first year of graduate medicine, which is the first two preclinical years in one. So I'm still quite early on. Um, but I do have a keen interest in emergency medicine. Uh, I did apply to PCP, but unfortunately I didn't get onto the course. Uh, but I'm considering doing their... Um, uh, integrated um, sort of project here you can do uh, but yeah just any advice for getting into the field really because I know it can be quite competitive um, yeah you're welcome to come join any of us during clinical shifts if you want to get experience there is a huge amount of teaching at, at Bart's Health we have um, trauma rounds medical rounds uh, on the first Thursday of each month, there's a HEMS Clinical Governance Day, which will deal mainly with the pre-hospital side. Um, the, there are research projects and teaching, any of which you can uh, make some effort to, to get involved in. And if you want to come shadow me with any rounds, you're very welcome. I'm based at the London and at WIPS. That would be amazing. Thank you so much. You can email me or, or Tim if you wanted to get some experience. Thank you. Is it possible to join the HEMS Clinical Governance Day, says Maxine. I do not know, maybe you do, Tim, whether yeah. it's... it's so, um, you know, what, what, one of the admirable things about HEMS is it is a very open organisation. So HEMS Clinical Governance Day begins with a closed meeting, i.e. those that are in HEMS, which is effectively a business management and discussion meeting. That typically runs from about 9 till 10.30. They then have an open forum. The open forum is a mixture of longitudinal audits, typically one HEMS case, one car case, and one PIU or medical case. Those audits look at how care was delivered against pre-agreed standards and i'll say at the outset i think london hems is one of the best governed institutions worldwide um, by governed i mean setting standards and openly auditing its practice to those standards and interspersed with that are a number of um talks those talks are often conference standard and by international experts such indeed as segs here um and uh it, it's a, a free event it takes place under the dental school usually in the bursted so it's just opposite the Whitechapel tubes it's very very easy to get to um, and it's a superb event I hope that answers your question well Tim I don't think there are any other questions in that case, Segs, I want to thank you once more. Magnificent talk. Really loved listening to you. And I'll look forward to meeting. We've got to meet face to face one of these days. And I'd love to pop over and see the wonderful things you do at Bart's. Yeah, come up for and, coffee and see some ECMO. Yeah, see some ECMO. It, it's a contact sport. Um, Although we are coming down, you've probably seen the transforming trauma stuff. So yes. we are increasingly coming down and putting trauma people on ECMO. Um, so we will we may run into each other professionally. That would be something to look forward to. Thank you. Uh, ben, thank you for all you're doing for the Masters and thank you for your expertise in chairing the session today. 
um, Chris, who you can just see the head of, is our, our lead for educational administration. And basically, Chris is the single most essential person to the master's programme. We are incredibly lucky to have her. Her email is uh, placed in the chat and uh, she, she deals with many of the administrative questions. Uh, David um, leads the advertising for our course and David is not visible other than by his name, but David, thank you very much for recording this and thank you for putting the links into the chat and making this happen. We are trying to run webinars about once a month. Each webinar involves an uh, invited expert speaker, and obviously this week SEGS, and we will advertise those by direct messaging you and by Twitter and by email lists. If you'd like to be on those lists, please contact David or me. So with that, I will thank all of you and close the session. I wish you a very pleasant weekend and take care of yourselves. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you, Shay. Bye-bye.